Thank you so much for joining. Um, just for the, the audience members, are you um, like faculty? Is that your, your main role? Or residents at all? Resident? Perfect. Okay. So the idea of this talk is um, we've all had experience with working with opioid stewardship programs in our hospitals. And I really think that emergency physicians are in a unique role to, to step up and, and do that and help the hospital and go even beyond the ED. And so we wanted to give you a little bit of a toolkit, um, just some, some ideas that you could take back home that hopefully you could use with your own institution. Um, so my name is Scott Weiner. I'm at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, Lewis Nelson is joining us from, uh, from Rutgers, Rutgers uh, in New Jersey. And then um, Jean Marie Perone was our, other, our third speaker. She unfortunately was unable to make it. So we're very grateful that Jason Hoppe from University of Colorado stepped in pretty last minute um, to talk about clinical decision support. So thank you, Jason. And thanks all for coming. Um, we have no conflicts of interest uh, relevant to this presentation. The objectives are we want to talk about how a hospital-wide opioid stewardship program can improve our pain management while preventing new cases of opioid use disorder. We're going to talk about, at the end, how we can actually improve care for patients with OUD. We're going to talk about metrics that you can use uh, based off of guidelines. And then we're also going to talk about uh, clinical decision support. And we're really getting a little bit into the weeds about that because it is so important and all of us are using EHRs. It's such a small group. If you guys want to interrupt, have questions, discussion, um, thanks for moving up. <laughs> it's intimate. Um, then uh, please, just, please just feel free to raise your hand. So. Um, so we did publish a couple papers about this, so if you want to look more in depth, um, you can. This is a paper that we published from my hospital that's in the journal of, uh, Joint Commission Journal of Quality and Safety. Um, we'll put our email address up at the end if you want a copy of that, we're happy to send it. And then uh, recently, uh, Jean Marie Lewis and I uh, published this paper on a similar topic in WestGem, um, which you can just freely download as open access. Or again, just, just email one of us and we can get that to you. Our state of Massachusetts was similar to pretty much every state. We always had a, like a, a, you know, a low level of, of heroin and, and opioid-related overdoses. And then around 2012 to 14, it just started to increase, rapidly increased to over 2,000 by the time we hit 2016. And I think that our, our hospital and all of our hospitals really do feel pressure. They get a uh, you know, joint commission that tells them they need to do pain control and opioid-related measures. Patients are looking for stuff that we have to do. Um, clinicians need guidance as well. They, a lot of the clinicians we encounter don't feel like they don't have the ac uh, ac adequate tools. Um, and then the government in many states is now telling us exactly what to do. Do you have a question? If you don't mind, just going back to that last slide. Yep. Do, you know, do you think is that surge stuff, like that's pretty solid? Uh, is that, is your sense of that, is that hyperogenic? Uh, part of it, like, is that a trackable thing? Or is it just the community that's become flooded with Chinese fentanyl or whatever the hell is coming into the, into the, into the North America, right? Yeah, so I don't have the slide on, on this presentation, but it's pretty cool to see what they've done at the state from like what actually is in the bloodstream of people who die from overdose. And you can see that for these first couple of years, like, you know, 11 to 14, it was, it was just, it was prescribed opioids. And then briefly it was, it was heroin. And then after that, especially in the Northeast, so the last two years, greater than 80% of our deaths have been with, with fentanyl. Yeah, that's yeah. Like a 212 probably corresponds to, sorry, I'm from Canada. Oh, okay. For us, it corresponds to, like, we have a similar curve of when um, OxyContin uh -huh. was government mandated to be removed or <laughs> reformulated to OxyMeal, uh -huh. presumably non-tempered, which of course doesn't work. Doesn't work, uh, right. I know you want to use microphones, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and, and this, the secondary question to, to that is also how much of it was iatrogenic because we got people hooked on opioids and then, then they, they turned to the illicit fentanyl that was out there. Um, so I, I think, you know, we always say like, keep opioid naive patients opioid naive as long as possible. That, that would be a, a good principle to, to maintain. Um, because the beginning certainly was iatrogenic, and then now it certainly is all, all fentanyl. So. No, that's a good question. Um, so within our, within our hospitals, it, we thought it was important to identify a champion. Um, the idea is that it's someone that's, that's non-departmental. -debar In my hospital, it's really a surrogate of the chief medical officer or the chief quality officer. Um, and I think funding is important, too. You have to be able to give that individual some time. And the idea is that we break down the silos. We say, you know, we're not going to be just pain and surgery and EM and IM. We're, it's just we're going to work all together. 
And, and I really think that this, we're, we're like, we as emergency physicians are uniquely qualified for this role, right? Because that's what we do all the time. We, we just interact with different specialties. You have a question? You're looking intently. Yeah. <laughs> So um, the first step we did was, uh, after we identified a champion, was to consolidate the current efforts. You'll probably see that in your hospital already, you have projects that are ongoing, usually within different departments. Uh, there could be guidelines that are uh, already existing. There could be things like we have an employee assistance program that does good things for our employees. Um, and then the other thing we thought was important was to have a top-down approach. We really did want to have leadership buy-in from this because of what the things that we're going to ask providers to do are are sometimes tough. We want them to follow guidelines. We want them to get clinical decision support into the EHR, which, which takes work and buy-in. So getting people on board really early is important. We developed a mission statement, um, which was basically to develop a comprehensive program that could measurably demonstrate implementation of guidelines for opioid prevention, opioid overdose prevention, prescribing, management of chronic pain, and then managing opioid addiction through technology, data, outreach, clinical support, and training. I put that up there just as, as an example. Feel free to poach whatever you want. I think that this is a tight enough group that we, we share very freely. This is our structure. Just to show you, you don't have to memorize this, but um, we have an executive committee, which is really the top down. And then we have three committees, which are prescribing, addiction, and education, which are kind of the bottom up, grassroots approach. And this is what we offer at our hospital. Um, I, I like to think of it as a tree with there's low hanging and high hanging fruit. And some things that you can organize would be naloxone distribution from the ED. Is everyone doing that? Anybody not doing that? Yeah, so there's actually a really good white paper that Jason was involved with from ASEP that delineates how you can, you can create a program. It's worth checking out if you don't do that yet. It, it's very creative as far as ways to, to figure that out. Drug take back. If you have an outpatient pharmacy at your, at your hospital, they can get a bin where your, your patients can just bring back unused medication. Um, some hospitals have them, some don't, but it's, it's a useful tool. And it's, when I'm counseling patients, I just say, hey, we have a bin around the corner, and you're done with these, just get rid of them. And patients are responsive to that now. We do a lot of gram rounds, like we do education around opioids, which is important. We read, read these guidelines, which I'll show you. Metrics are very important, which we'll, we'll spend a, some in-depth discussion about. Um, and then all the way up to our bridge clinic, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, this is our website. Um, I know other sites have, have websites as well, like Jean Maurice's program has a website. Um, we put a lot of stuff on here, so if you need resources, um, feel free to check that out. And again, we'll put email addresses at the end, too, if you have questions. One thing that I, I think is always um, catalyzing is Recovery Month. For those of you who don't know, in, in the U.S., at least, Recovery Month is in September. And so it's always a nice opportunity to highlight the work that's being done and to get people from around the system that are working on recovery. So we always have several uh, events around Recovery Month, and I, I think that we can all take advantage of that. Back about the, the t drug take back I talked about before, there's usually one or two drug take back days per, uh, per year that the DEA organizes, and so you can do that at your hospital as well. We, just a couple weeks ago we had a bin. It was on the main, main uh, you know, place where people walk through the main hallway, um, and people could bring back unused medications. So, um, so now looking, switching to guidelines, so guidelines are important. The way that I look at them is they shouldn't be mandates. They're, they would be, quote unquote, best practices, things that we do recommend providers use as a system. And you can get them from lots of places. You can get them from laws. If in some, some states, um, like Massachusetts, we have a very fairly draconian laws around opioids and what we have to do with them. Um, so that's automatic for guidelines. Then you'll see things from the CDC and certainly ASEP and AEM also have guidelines for opioid prescribing for the, e, for the ED. And then the Joint Commission, as of last January, also is mandating a lot of pain-related and opioid-related things that we do in the hospital. So those are a good place to start. And the way that I like to think about this is you've, you've probably heard about these, like, you know, Plan, Do, Study, Act, or PDSA cycles. It's very similar. We're, we take our guidelines, and then we measure them, and we, and we create our metrics based off our guidelines, what we wanted the providers to do. And then we, we make clinical decision support to help their decisions. And then we, we iterate, and we say, okay, what did we do? What did we do well? What do we need work on? And you just continue the cycle. So I think we can think of that in, in very similar ways. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lewis to talk in depth about guidelines. All 
All right, great. So uh, I appreciate that, Scott and, and, and all that are here. I, I want to sort of pick up where Scott left off and talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways that guidelines have been both implemented, used, and, and to some extent uh, misused. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that most people recognize is the title of this book, which was, a, was, was an IOM publication from 2011 that sort of put in, um, in, in motion a lot of the uh, approaches we take to, to the management of chronic pain, and which you know, at some level uh, um, uh, influences how we manage acute pain as well. This guideline, essentially, which was a 275-page book, was written by a group of pain docs who felt that we were inadequately managing uh, pain of our patients. And uh, in fact, they said, they said that we woefully undermanaged our patients' pain. And it really set in motion, again, a lot of the regulatory and legislative activities that occurred moving forward from then. Remember, already in 2011, there was a problem, well-recognized problem with the use of, of prescription opioids. We hadn't yet gone to 2010 and 2013 when heroin and fentanyl really started to, to uptick. And 2010 was the year, right before this, that, that we reformulated the United States at least oxycodone to be abuse deterrent. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have alternatives like the CDC guidelines that came out really to talk about responsibly managing chronic pain. This guideline was put together without any pain docs, right? So it took a completely different approach to the management of this problem. It didn't really address acute pain, but, you know, the CDC and other organizations, as I'll show you, are really addressing acute pain much, much more aggressively as they, as they really need to be. Uh, so guidelines are important for the simple reason that they improve consistency. And I think everybody recognizes that as a marker for quality, reducing variability, particularly unnecessary variability, is very important. And pain management becomes so important because, as I think is, is well known, it's, it's, a, it's a subjective, it's a subjective um, uh, complaint. It's not objectively measured. And there's a lot of uh, emotional and other, and other connections to it. And it puts a lot of burden on us as healthcare providers to try to manage our patients uh, pain uh, for all of the reasons that I think everybody's well versed in and the influences that we have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, guidelines also are focused on reducing harm while also maintaining appropriate use and actually treating patients. And as Scott already said, I think this is a mantra that I've learned to live by and many others have too. It's n nowhere has anybody suggested that we shouldn't use opioids. And I think people that come across saying we should be opioid free are, are a bit naive themselves because there's certainly pain that's opioid worthy. Now, the question really is what level level of pain, what risk are you willing to take, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get these things done. And that's what guidelines, when they're well constructed, really do help people understand uh, these things. One of the advantages of guidelines that allows you to really perform quality uh, uh, measures. Um, for example, you can look across your spectrum of providers and see how many of them are, are prescribing opioids for things that we wouldn't typically prescribe opioids for, such as headache and, 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 and low back pain. And then it allows you to try to normalize through education and other efforts some of the prescribing. Now, aberrant prescribing is very difficult to, to manage because each of us feels that we're an independent practitioner and we can do whatever we want. And I think there's something to be said for that, although if you can shift the, the curve a little bit, um, at least for the, for the outliers in both si on both sides. I mean, there, there are outliers who underprescribe, you know, presumably, and certainly those who overprescribe. It's, it's a culture change, and it's very difficult to do. Legislating or mandating this among your faculty is very hard. I've worked on and others have worked on putting together these sorts of prescribing guidelines. You'll see here from Washington State and, and Ohio and other jurisdictions, many places, including mine, I'll show you, produce institutional guidelines. When I was in New York City before I, I was in New Jersey, we put together early on an EDOP prescribing guideline, um, which actually worked really well and was widely accepted by the EDs to the, to the point at which we actually took it to a poster that we created and put in the waiting rooms of the emergency departments, um, but was felt by CMS to be an EMTALA violation actually because it, it was felt to, to dissuade people from seeking care for their pain. Even though we certainly never said we weren't going to treat their pain or prescribe opioids, it did suggest that we wouldn't um, do so liberally. Um, what then happened, of course, was most emergency departments moved it from the waiting room back past uh, you know, by the bedsides. Uh, but what it really did, and when you talk to, to, to providers, what they really liked about the poster and the guidelines is it gave them a way to actually talk to their patients and, and provide them support for the decisions they were making. Remember, this is no different than the, the, the patient who comes and asks for antibiotics for their runny nose. It's, it's a much more difficult conversation to have about why you, why you won't prescribe it than just to give them a prescription. Right? So by being able to at least point to something or hand them something, a guideline or a rule or, or a poster, whoops, I think this is what we were talking about. Um, 
Okay, so uh, this was just a study we did that we followed up some of the, the, uh, out, the uh, outcomes of our poster. And you really could see that it, it did provide people an outlet to, um, to sort of blame uh, much more easily a guideline rather than have to take the burden on themselves, which clearly was able to end the conversation a lot more quickly. Many places, this is, I think, the state of Pennsylvania, came out with dozens of guidelines, very targeted, rather than just broad, a broad scope of guidelines like CDC or, 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 or the EDs did. This really targeted very, very, you know, individual practices and groups, which works well. It becomes a little bit difficult to manage, and many people still refer back to the CDC guidelines, um, perhaps to a fault. Uh, you know, these were really meant for chronic pain, although there were some comments in here about acute pain. But what many places have done, whether it's insurance companies or regulators in states, they've really made these rules rather than guidelines. And there was a, a letter produced just a few weeks ago by the CDC clarifying their position was never for these to be a rule, but rather to be a guideline. Nobody said if you're on 200 MMEs, you should be scaled back to 90. But it said if you're on zero, you shouldn't go up past 90. Right? Because there is an inflection point in some of the data that show that beyond that, you start to see an increased risk of, of, of harm, uh, a substantial increased risk of harm with, from unintended opioid-related uh, uh, consequences. Each individual uh, professional organization, too, had started putting out guidelines, including ASEP, and this was one of the guidelines that came out. There were several others that you might have seen that came out through ASEP and other organizations, and they're working on, on new ones as we speak all well-intended and well-directed, all basically saying the same thing, but everybody wanted to be on, on, this, on this same page with a, with a target audience that they have for their own um, audiences. For example, we spent a lot of time in ours talking about non-pharmacologic pain management and some of the alternatives, which nobody else really uses, such as sub-dissociative dose ketamine. It's just not used pretty much in any other specialty but ours, which raises a lot of eyebrows and causes us to do a, a lot of uh, fancy footwork with our pharmacy and therapeutics committees and our anesthesiology colleagues and other things. But once we win those battles, I think they tend to be a nice tool in our armamentarium to fix that. This is the guidelines we created at my current hospital. Many of you probably have something similar to these. We have, I think, 15 different pain syndromes that we create, a sort of a, a, a measurable um, uh, pathway that uses opioids but uses them sparingly and appropriately in their um, individual, whoops, um, sorry, in the, in this, uh, Oh, use the clicker. Oh, is that what I'm supposed to do? Okay. In their, in their uh, um, you know, very specific, fi finite way. Um, many have seen the guidelines that the surgeons have put together in their ERAS program to try to really minimize uh, post-operative opioid use. And they've actually done a great job in, in, in showing how really short-course opioid therapy is the way to go because the longer you prescribe, as, as we've come to recognize, the, the greater the risk. It's not as much the dose as it is the duration of treatment that seems to be linked to persistent opioid use, probably to some extent through hyperalgesia, to some extent through the risk of developing opioid dependence, and of course guidelines for looking at things like buprenorphine um, administration to treat people who are suffering opioid addiction. So although it's, it's, not, it's not the use of opioids for pain, it's the use of opioids for dependence. Um, Many states, as Scott has mentioned, have taken on fairly draconian positions to doing this, and often they're misguided. So in New Jersey, we have a five-day opioid prescribing rule. The problem is nobody tells you what five days of opioid prescribing includes. And people have taken to some very perverse practices, like giving people four pills every four hours, right? So they wind up going home with prescriptions for 60 opioids that last five days, right? I think the intent was very clearly not to do that, but there's no rule against it, and, and you know you can't give them more than five days. So you can tell them whatever you want, but you can prescribe them how you're allowed. So there are problems with guidelines. I mean, guidelines are subjective and, and generally based on poor evidence. Uh, certainly in this field, you know, maybe the guidelines for managing cardiovascular complications of things are much better developed, but for us, it's a little bit more subtle. Uh, guideline develop might be conflicted, as I pointed out with the IOM report. And then, as I pointed out with the CDC report, they may, may, may be misapplied and misinterpreted. Um, for example, uh, many of you know about the opioid REMS, which are associated with the extended release um, and long-acting opioids. The FDA has a, um, has a, has a, a REMS, a risk, a risk evaluation mitigation strategy associated with that to help people understand how to use them safely. It's not mandatory, uh, it's, it's voluntary, but they fund organizations to put out educational strategies about how to use opioids safely. Right? And the big company that does this is called the REMS company. Of course, the money that they funnel into funding the REMS company comes from 24 different opioid manufacturers 
manufacturers, which does seem to be internally, of course, a conflict of interest and something that we have to be really careful about. So you might have heard the expression that I always like to quote it from Mark Twain about be careful about reading uh, health books because you may die of a misprint. One of the things you have to think about when it comes to things like this is that conflicts of interest are very prevalent. So be careful reading some of these clinical guidelines because you may die of a conflict of interest. And I'll move on to Jason. All right, thanks. So I think I, I, I'm not an expert in clinical decision support, but um, I see the ways to operationalize the guidelines that we have and um, start decreasing variability. Um, Lewis mentioned that as, as a way to improve quality. Um, I think we're all probably aware of uh, decreasing adverse events, the, the alerts we get that sometimes can be prohibitive, but really looking at it as a way to offload the cognitive load from providers to help um, stay in line with high quality decisions without, uh, while doing some of the background work for them. Um, uh, one of the initial steps I think that was more difficult and it's probably less difficult for people that are closer to getting to starting their career is really getting everybody on board about the shared goal um, of working together with EHRs. We, we see them as something that just makes us put in dot phrases and takes away the personal touch and sucks up all of our time. But, but we are the customers here and so when we talk about vendors and the IT groups on campus it really should be driven around um, our needs rather than us adjusting ourselves to them. Um, and so we've worked on a bunch of uh, projects. I'm going to talk about a couple here, but um, I, I think the most important thing kind of globally to think about whenever anything great comes out like EHRs or specific to, my, to most of my work, PDMPs, is this initial spike in excitement um, that you, know, you then realize that it's more work. For example, PDMPs, it's a lot of work. Nobody's using them. Nobody knows how to interpret them. And uh, then at some point you're going you're gonna to get to the point where you probably get to, to the maximize the, the productivity of it and it's going to be a useful intervention for you. So uh, for PDMPs, I would say we're, we're on that getting you know, upward slope. The second one, we've already been through the excitement um, and disappointment. So um, I'll talk about kind of how we've integrated those. Um, a lot of slides here, I'm not going to go one by one, but just in case you are interested in doing um, some clinical decision support building at your site. But really the main tenants are, it's in the workflow, so you, know, you don't leave your EHR to go log into your PDMP and transcribe a bunch of information, so it's, it improves your efficiency. It's at the point of decision making, which I'll talk about, right, so just in time, so you get the information when you need it, not two days before. Now that's true, and when we go to the hospital, that may not, may not be true. So. If you're in a clinic, you may want all of your information up front before you plan your day, and so these are some of the things we learn as we roll it out to other sites. Um, and then we have the ability to um, help with interpretation. So it's not just the raw data, it's the data in the context of some other information that's in, that's in the chart. Um, downsides are, are obviously pe changing people's workflow, nobody likes that. Um, and if you put a crappy product out there, people like immediately know that that's the case. So if you're getting a ton of alerts, um, you're going to get a ton of complaints. Um, if the knowledge is not kept up to date or it's hard to navigate, um, I think we're all familiar with some of these mistakes that have been made in the EHRs. And PDMP falls under a lot of these, right? There's the first issue we first turned on PDMPs were clicks, logins, um, not matching patients, things like that. And you lose a lot of people's confidence um, if you don't address those up front. Uh, and then I think the most important thing that we've learned from rolling out, I mean, I don't know how it is everybody else, but at our academic center, usually when you get told to do something, most people do it. They, there's some complaints, but they'll sort of, they've been beat down enough to change that we accept it. That is not necessarily true in the community. So we have, we've rolled out interventions from our site and the community site, and they're vastly different, even having champions there. Um, and, and really the feedback we've gotten is the, this ability to demonstrate tangible improvements so that the time that you're spending on this uh, is being fed back to you with some patient outcomes or where you are relative to your peers. Um, otherwise for them, you know, if you're, if you're busy and uh, your salary depends on, you know, what you kill, you eat what you kill, you're, you're not going to spend time on things that are not giving you tangible feedback. Uh, this is just a basic overview of what we do. I think anything could fit in here. You could substitute um, guidelines, but we pull in multiple data sources, merge them, um, and then put them through a screen so that you can uh, adjust what gets pushed forward. Uh, and then really, and the end product here is you have something that's uh, quick, doesn't take time, it's in the, where you want it to be, and it gives you actionable information, so not stop signs. It points you in a direction. If you're interested in doing this, it's definitely not a straight route. Um, we've been fortunate 
uh, spending a lot of time. We, we heard about um, getting leadership on board early for um, building your own uh, program. I, this is the same thing. I, I can tell you that the lessons, the, the main takeaways um, are really, if you're doing it internally, to think about the outcomes out front. We made a mistake. We built some stuff that was not a discrete data point, so we went to go pull it. Um, it was very difficult. So having the report writers uh, that do work in, we have Epic, but um, you know, the, most of these systems you can pull the data afterwards and prospectively thinking about what you want to measure and building that in is of utmost importance. Um, the costs can vary, um, but really I, for the most part, which I think another theme to take in here is that it's pretty rare that you're the first person doing this at, the, at your institution um, and that the costs can really be compared to much larger programs. Um, and you can offset here, as long as you plan appropriately for some outcomes, um, you have a lot of data to pull back, to bring back uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the, the ED is a great place to do these because we have, you know, a lot of patients, quick decision making, so it's, it's an it's a ideal um, area for beta, beta testing. Um, if you're interested in, in doing these programs, I think there's, there's three kind of main choices. You can just buy an already made product and plug it in. If you're on, I don't know Cerner as well, but if you're on Epic, there's an Orchard where you can actually go. There's a lot of programs out there. There are companies, we work with a couple companies that pay to embed um, to look at the outcomes, and I'll show you what they look at. But, so they definitely exist. There are some that are a little bit more modifiable um, that you can just take pieces of. And then there's building your own. Um, and Scott t talked about this a little bit, but really whatever you're building, same thing when you roll out a program, it needs to be the end users have to be engaged, and you're going to have to have an iterative process in order to get it where you want it, um, even if you're taking one from the outside. If you're taking something from the outside that you're not building, you there's some important questions. A lot of these companies will charge pretty significant money, um, and they just sort of download their product, and they say, there you go. Um, you're off, you know, and so the, the questions that you need to think about is, you know, is it ready to use in my system? For example, one of ours they told us is ready in Epic and didn't connect to Epic, and we had to go through that. Um, is, has it been used? Like, what are the information you can tell me on how many, how often are the alerts being fired? How often are they being bypassed? Um, and unanticipated consequences, I think, is important for us, right? So if you're driving care in one direction, and um, we need to think about what the, the potential consequences of, of that are, um, downstream for our patients as well. And then the cost, obviously. Uh, it is costly to, to build your own. Um, buying them can, all, can often be uh, very um, tantalizing, but if that doesn't include ongoing costs and you don't have access, you can imagine what happens on a Friday night of a three-day weekend if the system shuts down and everybody's dependent upon it. It can be uh, painful. Uh, these are all the ways that you can screw up making a clinical decision support and uh, really lose people. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but um, this is out there. I think it lays it out pretty, pretty well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about monitoring here in a sec, but I think one of the other things to consider is when you do it. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but so we've looked at, uh, for example, PDMP where we've done the most work is, do you want that before seeing the patient? So you can imagine going into the room with a full knowledge of what's happened and how that could sear your uh, conversation with the patient uh, versus the time we fire alerts uh, when you go to write a prescription, right? So if you haven't checked it already and you go to write a prescription, it pings the PDMP for you and pushes it forward so that now you have that information. Um, and then we've talked about we are working on some shared decision making that would also kind of be uh, triggered from that potential alert to say, hey, this person is already on three prescriptions. This is potentially the opportunity to talk about them, about their opioid use disorder, um, uh, and do some education with the patients. Um, and so the, the two main, uh, there was a great poster on this uh, yesterday, but the two main approaches are passive. So that's what we do most of our time, right? Uh, the labs and everything. Uh, and a lot of the guidelines exist in the background, um, and you can pull them forward as needed. Um, that sounds great, um, and there's benefits to providers not getting fatigued, but really, uh, they, we don't have time to do these things. And so we have really have tried to move forward to active pushes where information comes at you when you need it. And so obviously, it's a very fine line between fatigue and, and you have to be a little bit more um, on top of how often it's happening and what's happening when people see these uh, alerts. But these systems have gotten pretty uh, agile at, at doing a lot of this information in the background um, and really, I think, um, improving care for, the, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So bringing in prior, prior visits, bringing in the PDMP data, um, have they, uh, do they have an active prescription in our system? 
Um, have they exceeded the threshold already? Are they on a, uh, another sedative? Things that can inform your decision and having that all done for you without you having to physically look um, and everybody getting the same information um, is, has positive benefits. And then this is just a picture. This is our, that, that's our, you know, one of our work bars, our, our chunky PDMP button. So it's available. You, you can look at it. Maybe, maybe a, we print it out. We have, I know this is off topic, but I've definitely had patients bring their PDMP uh, print out to the patient to inform some of their own decision making and shared decision making. But uh, this is uh, an example of our older alert um, where you can see somebody's gone to write a prescription um, and they've uh, clicked off one of the best practices and then it brings you to the link and that link takes you straight to the PDMP information. So uh, it's a one click uh, access. Um, so I, I think that, that when you talk about how automated, uh, there's definitely a variety of uh, approaches, right? So um, from just overload, uh, where we're making, doing all the work to the computer is, you know, autonomous and Skynet is live. But so we can imagine with these apply differently to different things, right? So I don't really care if a patient gets a tetanus shot, if they haven't had one, that should be something that's totally automated. Uh, if you're talking about a prescription somewhere in there, um, the, if you're pushing somebody to do something or giving them an out, um, that can be automated. So for example, we can, if somebody has a high risk, we can say um, this patient's high risk, um, sort of uh, implementing the guideline that, that uh, Lewis just showed. So this person has dental pain, they're high risk. Um, have you considered? And then we, we have built in the actual prescription. We just hit the button and it'll send out, you know, a, a gram of acetaminophen. And, and so you're giving them a way out to, so that they don't have to go back and start over. But um, now they, have make, they can make the decision that's informed. And they can still do it, but most of the stuff happens in the background. And then really the, the final decision is up to the prescriber. Um, so outcomes for this I, I think are difficult. Most of the things, and there's been a bunch of posters here, that I know you can still download, but really most of them are about acceptability. Um, does everybody like it? In general, satisfaction is quite high with these. Uh, the harder ones are the ones lower down, right? So I, I mentioned building with the intent to measure these, but we use a lot of the, uh, the clinical stuff that we already measure, but really building in things like how often was it bypassed? Do you, do you have to do you allow them an out so we don't do hard stops? So we can't stop somebody from doing something, but we can you know, nudge them. And so if they're gonna bypass it, one of the things you can do is have a pull down where it says, I'm bypassing this because, so it adds an additional step. We then rotate their choices so that they don't just pick the first one, but um, ideally that'll be part of the iterative process as to why people are bypassing your alert. And then really patient-centered. So for us, we have the ability to link um, these interventions with, um, with our PDMP program in our state, and so we look at things like, um, did you look at the, or so we'll have the PDMP was mandated, which a lot of states are doing, and so now we have the ability to say, PDMP was mandated, they were compliant, um, how did it change the patient course? Was the patient previously opioid naive, and now you set them off on some course? Does this ED visit make a difference? Do they get a prescription from somebody else 48 hours later? Um, and we've sort of wasted our time, um, and we can't stop the, the momentum. And then the economic game, gains are a little bit harder for cost effectiveness, um, but um, uh, they're, they're starting to get some data out there. We have, uh, you know, if you're doing this from a research perspective, um, there are some challenges. I, I, we have done some, the move to kind of quasi-experimental step wedge where we, you know, we, also, we had the options of, it's, it, like I said, it's pretty interesting what you can do. You can actually randomize by provider so that half your providers get the intervention, half don't. Um, you can't randomize by patient because there's, you know, the providers have already been exposed, but you can randomize by pro provider. We tend to do it by site, and then we roll out incrementally from different sites. So uh, we do three-month blocks, and then we do it at our six different hospitals. And now we'll be doing it at clinics and then outpatient prescriptions, both from the hospital list and from surgical. Um, yeah, and uh, making sure you have the right outcomes. So, for example, our outcomes in the ED are, um, as you can imagine, for for patient outcomes are a lot different than what the clinics are looking for, so trying to build those in um, ahead of time um, is of utmost importance. And then last thing, uh, I think I mentioned it, but uh, this can seem really overwhelming, but there's somebody, if you're on a major, if you're in a major hospital or campus, there's somebody else doing it, find them, 
partner up um, and set your expectations low. Um, and then you'd be surprised how, for, especially if you have a decent inf informatics group, how excited they get about this stuff. Um, and it can, these programs can really roll. I have zero informatics um, expertise, but we've had the ability to, to do like our fourth program now, the add MAT, um, that drive patient care without, um, without a, a ton of pushback. And I have, I do get money, the, the ones that were, we've done have been grant funded, but um, the overall cost of them, most of the cost is not on the build. So I don't, like for example, we pay the, the builders something on the order of like 60 bucks an hour to do the build. So it's not expensive. A typical uh, small program is 40 hours. So you, that's, you know, few thousand dollars to build is something that's not overwhelming and you probably could get pilot money for. That's all I got. Thanks. Um, so just for the last part too, if you want to, if you want to go, I'll go fast, yeah. Um, so just for the last part, I wanted to show you some concrete examples and then talk quickly just about substance use disorder treatment. All right, back up here. So just, um, I'll just kind of go quickly through some of these. Uh, so this is just an inpatient pain order set that we created. You know that you've all seen the scenario of someone gives two milligrams of morphine and it doesn't work, so they give two milligrams of hydromorphone, and of course, it, you know, the patient overdoses. So we wanted to try and avoid that in our floor. So it's very, um, very standardized by pain severity and then by risk factors for the patient as well. Like Jason mentioned, we also have PDMP integration. Um, if you don't have this yet, it is like the best thing ever. It's you push one button and in five seconds you get the PDMP. There's no web portals, there's no other passwords to remember. It's, it's really nice. We actually just showed, well, we just found this out a couple weeks ago that we increased our searches by 42% um, just by, by doing this. Of course, our prescription rates didn't change at all, but um, that's a different topic. Uh, medication management agreements. Um, these aren't important for the ED, but again, I wanted to give a sense of if you step up and do this for the hospital, this would be important. We designed it so we have this little QR code at the top and it gets scanned into the computer and then we know that by a header on the EHR that the patient has this. So then we can see it in the, in the ED very easily. And the other thing is that you can start to make some pretty cool modules, like this one's an opioid refill module for the primary care physicians or pain clinics, where you can say, whenever they go to refill, it says, wait, hang on a second, hold on a second, you don't have a pain treatment agreement, or hold on a second, you don't have a, a, an appointment within the next four months, which is our, is our guideline. Um, so it automates these things and puts them at the point of care, and the providers actually do like this. Um, we have automatically included instructions, so if I write for an opioid at discharge, these instructions will auto-populate for the patient. And some other stuff that, um, that like Zach and, uh, and Kit did, this is about uh, default pill counts, uh, where if you can actually get them to change the defaults of the numbers of pills that you prescribe for a certain medication, like oxycodone or hydrocodone, you can affect how prescribers prescribe. Uh, pretty innovative. This is work that Jason did where actually just telling your providers you're going, to sh you're going to start looking at their prescribing rates of opioids, just that caused it to decrease, which I always thought was pretty interesting. Um, and then take it, um, a, there was another next step further beyond Jason's study, which was at uh, University of Massachusetts, where they found that providers that underestimated their reporting actually responded much better, much in a, a uh, it was more impactful when they showed them their own data. So what we do at our, at our hospital is um, we decided to show it in a de-identified fashion. So all the providers get a three-digit number that basically only they know and I know and that's it. And I show them their rate for, per 1,000 discharged patients. And I show them what the mean is and I show them if they're above or below a standard deviation. The providers that are above a standard deviation, I send them an email. Do you want to sit down? Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to just, you know, see what, what your thoughts are. Um, and if, I've had a couple people take me up on it and we usually go over guidelines and we go over some cases like someone was prescribing lots of opioids for dental pain all the time and we talked about blocks and other things. Are there any studies done in uh, systems where you don't have a lot of time to prescribe? Um, because if you're in a paper-based environment, which is very difficult to collect provider-level data, but avoid just some other mm -hmm. database to find out what they're prescribing. Yeah, so this is all on, well, so this is electronic prescribing, but they, a paper printout. So I, if I understand, so there's, I, maybe we're talking about two separate things, because for my perspective, electronic prescribing means it goes automatically to the pharmacy. No, so, oh, sorry, I'll oh, You have electronic health record that generates the prescription. Uh -huh. So there's a electronic footprint of that prescription. Mm -hmm. Yes. Provider. If you work in a hospital system that doesn't have that, it's all paper. That would be very difficult. Yeah. 
Are you still using script pads? Oh my, yeah. Yeah, so that, that would be very difficult to do something like this, absolutely. And look back. Yeah, our, our problem is we have something like that, the ladder, but um, you can't really use that to give feedback. I, I can't access all the people in the, in the group to give their data. It's a state, state accesses that and then, or keeps that and then only the, the prescriber can access their own data. Um, we, we use the PDMP for that, but it's all de-identified. So we, you can put a request in for your hospital system and then you can get it out kind of high level view, um, but it won't, it will never identify a provider, patient, or pharmacy. <clears throat> But the question is, why don't you have e-prescribing? Sorry? Why don't you have e-prescribing? Why? why don't you have e-prescribing? Electronic prescribing. Why don't you have that? Oh, our hospital hasn't made that new yet. Because you, so you don't even, you just don't they even have a order. Basic data management system, but they don't have uh, electronic records and collect. I mean, you have a paper chart, for example, in RDD that gets scanned into mm -hmm. a Meditech type system, but you don't have the, the uh, front end. Yeah, it's, it's, it would be very hard to do this because you have to do it all manually. Yeah. Um, and then the last part is just about um, how you actually uh, treat patients with opioid use disorder. There's been a lot of talk about this recently over the past couple of years, starting with a study that they did in Yale where they actually had follow-up within the, the next business day for their patients. We did this as well at our hospital. Um, there's a clinic. It's, a, it's around the corner from the ED. The, the idea is it's low barrier to access. We don't care what insurance you have. We don't care if you're actively using drugs. We don't care if you even wanted to have more, do more than just have a cup of coffee and a discussion. Or we'll, we'll, we'll take you. So it's non-judgmental. The ED is not the only place that feeds into it. Also inpatients when they're discharged and also from the, the primary care clinics as well. And um, the roles we have there I think are, are uh, interesting. We have both psychiatrists and other types of, of medical specialists that, that staff the clinic. So we have an ID doctor and we have a hospitalist and we have a family practitioner. They, um, they can write buprenorphine when, at, when indicated. And then we have a recovery coach who shares their lived experience. And we have a care transition specialist that we were talking about. It helps with getting cell phones and getting IDs and getting housing and things that a lot of our patients don't have. So the question is about if we, if we make the di that diagnosis of OUD. So it's, a, it's, a, it's usually obvious in some situations, especially for the patients that we refer over. They come in and they say, I'm in withdrawal. I use opioids. I'm, I, I don't want to go back to the street and start injecting more heroin. Help me. So you, you don't need that kind of, that kind of help. It's, it's more for that patient, um, that someone that had overdosed, that um, they were re reversed with naloxone. And we can say, hey, I can get a social worker at the bedside now. We can get you into the bridge clinic the next business day. We can talk about starting buprenorphine once you're, you know, once, once, once you start withdrawing. Um, and uh, it's more for that patient. So it's, it's more obvious than, than that. So it's for the covert patient, not necessarily the covert OED. We, we, we have, um, we, we have like, from primary care especially, we have, we have that patient where they're not sure if they're misusing or not. It's a little bit interesting because if we send the patient there, they, they're, they're, they feel like they're labeled with, with addiction. Right? They feel like they're labeled with opioid use disorder. We've got people that can refer there and they're like, what am I doing here? I'm not, I, I'm not an addict, you know, I'm not a druggie. Um, so making that, that, making that step before, and I did, I did air quotes, I hope you guys saw that. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to talk about stigma in a second too. Um, but um, yeah, so prepping them before sending them to the clinic that this is an addiction clinic uh, is important. So you were, were going to say something? No, as I say, we, we screen for it uh, in the ED, so we pick up other people. Most of the patients we pick up actually do not present with overdose. Um, the highest ones were cellulitis, abscess, but we see a lot of variety of other stuff. And we document the DSFM criteria as part, you're not going to like this, within our electronic record that's prompted, um, or we, have our, we actually have a social work team as part of it to offload the providers. So the social work team sweeps in, and that's one of their jobs. And that's required before starting them on, on buprenorphine. And so we start, we will write buprenorphine in our clinic. We don't have a bridge clinic. We have patients that won't have an appointment for a week. And so we have to write the appropriate amount of buprenorphine. And so we document everything as if they are now have that diagnosis. 
But if I could just say, I, I, I support your concern about the ED becoming a screening site for people with opioid use disorder. I, I don't know that that's really within our purview for a lot of reasons, one of which is sort of the unfunded mandate problem associated with it. So the word overt opioid use disorder makes a lot of sense. So if you come with an overdose, if you come in withdrawal, if you come in seeking treatment, but you know, whether we should be screening people like we do with a cage questionnaire or a domestic violence screen or a smoking screen, that's a big lift for most people, especially since we're, you know, if they're not overtly in need of treatment, all we're gonna do is defer them out. We're not gonna use buprenorphine in the ED. Many of the criteria that you would feed that list require months of Right, and so I'm not sure that it's our job to find every last user, but I think it's much more to say, if we know you have a problem, we can treat you now rather, because you know, if you give somebody a piece of paper and say, here's a five clinics in town, go find one, that paper is gonna wind up in the garbage can and they're gonna wind up on the street. But at least if you can do something better, whether it's a peer navigator or at least initiation of buprenorphine with a bridge, you're gonna get much better compliance, meaning they're gonna show up at clinic it's still going to be 30%, not, but it's not going to be 0%. So it's, it's, that's how I think we really view it. Yeah. In these last two slides, I'll actually show you the outcomes that we have with this model. So this was between um, April 18 to around February of this year. We had 277 patients that were referred. 75% um, made it to the clinic. So already we have attrition. There's, there's always going to be you know, a, third, a quarter to a third of patients that don't make it. But if they do make it to the clinic, they do really well. We found that 85% of our patients that made it have still stayed in treatment, which is really, really high for this patient population. And we've also looked at ED um, utilization for at least the first uh, couple of months that we did this, and it decreased by two-thirds. So people are always concerned about, well, if we start doing this, we're going to get you know, all these people that flooding our doors. The reality is that it's the opposite, that we're going to be treating them finally, and that there's no recidivism for abscesses and overdoses and all these other things we're seeing. The real compelling thing for your hospital, if you're trying to sell this to the hospital, are your patients with complications of in injection drug use. So you probably all have patients that, are, that have endocarditis from injection drug use. They stay sometimes for weeks in the hospital. And the reason is that they need it, they usually have, need six weeks of IV antibiotics, they have a PICC line, and no one wants to take them. The VNAs don't want them to be at home. Rehab facilities don't want to take them. So we actually start them on buprenorphine in the hospital. We get them back to our bridge clinic twice a week. And we've had about, now we've had 20 patients that have done this and they've all done well. So this is, if you want to sell this to the hospital, 17 patients saved an estimated 500 days, right? Like the, if we all have crowding, right? This is, this is the most compelling reason. This is why we got this, this clinic. And the very last slide I have is just about stigma I mentioned before. I think we, we all have a responsibility to address stigma. This is an extremely stigmatizing disease. People are suffering because of that. So even these terms like clean, dirty, addict, uh, druggy, uh, uh, you know, not just saying opioid use disorder as another, as another disease, um, actually do really matter. And so um, this is a statement that's available on that website I showed you before, um, and there's plenty of these around too, so please, please do help spread that word. Um, so we do have, I think we have a few minutes. We're supposed to end at 9.50, but I think we have the room till 10. So. We were hoping to have more of a discussion as well, too, if there's a, other questions or thoughts. I've mean, already had some good ideas. Yeah, they, and they want us to use the microphone, too, to capture it. Um, maybe you can pass it around. Does uh, this one work? Does this one work? Yeah, OK. Um, so I'm Josh. I'm at uh, Houston Methodist Hospital. We recently, last year, started an opioid stewardship program. And when you start one of those programs, you have to think very carefully about jurisdiction. And so we felt like the hospital setting and the emergency department would be under the jurisdiction of our opioid stewardship program. So it's being led by a system quality kind of perspective. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, we, I think earlier in the presentation you talked about, there are a lot of guidelines and kind of <clears throat> recommendations. A lot of those focus on acute, uh, on uh, management of patients in a chronic setting and an outpatient setting. And so we have to kind of translate those into the hospital and ED settings. And so we tried to do our best over about a three to four month period with a consensus setting process to establish what we felt like were reasonable quality indicators for the hospital and ED setting. We published that. So we've kind of gone through and we've extracted like 60 or so quality indicators we felt like were feasible and we prioritized a list of 19 that we felt like were probably the ones that we wanted to focus our resources on. So we made that available. Just wanted to bring that up in case someone's trying to start an opioid stewardship program. We're hopeful that our work will 
kind of be a foundation for you to kind of start your process. And one of the things you mentioned earlier that's incredibly important is you think about unintended consequences. So when you start looking at our list of quality indicators, you might see things that you were expecting to be a top indicator, but it's lower, and that's because we started having conversations about how that might be used for um, peer to peer feedback that might have um, unintended or, or inappropriate consequences. And so we kind of tried to prioritize thinking about how, how quality indicators might create subversive behavior sometimes on accident. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Which, which hospital is it again? It's uh, Houston Methodist. Hey, Houston Methodist, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this, our, our, yeah. our quality indicators were published in the American Journal of Hospital uh, Health System Pharmacy in like February of 2019. So very recent. So I didn't send you awesome. any of this, but, but hopefully it's something that will be helpful. Yeah, the way, the way I view this, and I think we all do, is this is a totally a team sport. And um, so the more we can share is, is great. It's interesting for these metrics because I, my, my role for as the as director of the hospital stewardship program, the open stewardship program, is within Department of Quality and Safety. Mm -hmm. And they love metrics. And they, they, they either like it to be 0% or 100%. Right. And for so many of these things, there is no 0 or 100, right? So I think back to Lewis's point, like we try and focus on variability. Mm -hmm. So if you're a standard deviation or two standard deviations above or below, that's, that's kind of where we, we focus our efforts. It's not, we're not, we're not saying, like, don't prescribe opioids. It's just do them safely. Right. So, and all these quality yeah. indicators, they're going to have some prevalence that's allowable, some, some prevalence of behavior that's appropriate. So yeah. like you said, you're not trying to get to 0 or 100. You just look at, you know, this is a reasonable proportion. And, and you're going to have different behaviors in the PACU and in the OR and perioperative patients than you're going to have on the medicine floors. And so an open research program is to be very careful about not trying to push a metric in all those settings because that metric may have different behaviors that are appropriate in those different settings. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Hi, I'm uh, Akash. I'm one of the senior residents over at Rutgers, and I'm hoping to, to do my part on initiatives like this at uh, uh, where I land next. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts in terms of things you know now that you wish you knew then, uh, then being the, the start of this journey, just so I could be mindful of those things as I start to, to engage on this front. Very, this is very front of mind for me right now. I, I will let the other Jason and Lewis comment too. But beware of rheumatologists. <laughs> That's, I'll leave it at that. They're a tough group. They prescribe a lot of opioids, and they're, they're like, you know, they have a lot of questions. No, um, I, it, I, it's really it's really early buy-in, making sure that that everyone's on board with it. Um, as particularly coming as an emergency physician, you have to you have to be cognizant of the fact that you're you're like you. You don't want to just go to the surgeon and say, hey, how come you're prescribing 30 pills? What's wrong with you? You know, it can't be that approach. It has to be more circuitous as you're, as you're working with their leadership and saying, like, let's look at this. And maybe you guys can do a QA study in which you say, you know, look at how many pills your patients are using at their first post-op visit. And let's see if we can, we can right-size that. You know, that collaboration is very individualized depending on the specialty that you're working with. Um, so just a lot of meetings, a lot of face-to-face, -face, a lot of prep work is very important for this. I don't know if you guys have other, other thoughts, too. And you reach out in the future, too. I'm happy to, to compare notes and bounce ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, it's Neil Upati from uh, Hamilton, Ontario again. Um, just a question going back to one of your earlier slides about uh, those, the, some of those guideline statements about keeping your prescriptions down to seven days, or I guess laws, actually. They're not guidelines in certain jurisdictions, correct? Um, I'm wondering, um, we had a group that looked at all the international prescribing guidelines for opioids last year. And for EM relevant recommendations, and we published it in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine because it was, there was a complete paucity of useful recommendations. A lot of motherhood and apple pie statements like keep it low, uh, keep it low potency, short acting, and all such things, but they weren't actually evidence based. I'm just curious if uh, any of these programs that are here going on here, do they look at once the patient leaves the emergency department with X number of pills? How many are they actually using at the end of a week or so? Were well, there some presentations here by Raul Dodo at Quebec who has actually prospectively got a cohort of a multiple hospitals? And last year, for example, he presented that for patients with renal colic, they go home with 24 pills of some opioid. And when they called him a week later, there was a 90% fill rate, but the actual consumption was only eight pills out of 24. Yeah. So in that 12-week window for one site with X number of patients, there were 8,800 pills available for diversion or misuse. Yeah in one site for 12 weeks. So extrapolate that across a jurisdiction or a country, that's a lot of pills. I'm wondering if there's a lot of anybody, any work doing on that saying like, this is the right amount of pills of this medication to give for that condition. Yeah, I'll give you my, my opinion, and I'm sure these guys have an opinion too. And actually, you've done, you've done work with that with back pain as well, which is interesting. But, um, the, um, so we actually have some, some colleagues of, in my group that use digital pills that would, um, there was like a little capsule of five milligrams of oxycodone mixed with a little radio transmitter. 
and you'd ingest it, and then when it hit the stomach, it would turn on, and it would talk to a, re a receiver, and you could tell exactly when the patient took the pill and how many they took. And so they enrolled patients from the ED with long bone fractures that were being discharged. So you know, these are ankles and wrists and things like that, humerus. Um, and the median numbers of pills consumed, they gave them 15, it was six. And that's, that's been my experience too. I think that when we have acute pain, it's usually one, two, three days at the most, usually very, very, very rarely do people need fewer, more than eight to 10 pills. And that seems to be consistent across all sorts of conditions, not just in the ED, but even like post-op. We're starting to give our post-op appies 10 pills. That's it. And I think that maybe uh, Lewis showed that in his slides too as well. That's all they need. They don't, people don't need 30 pills or 60 pills. So um, that's, that's my perspective. I don't know if you guys want to weigh in too. We're at the end. Oh. But this is more exciting. All right. Thanks for your attention.